Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone um, involved in the North Canberra Community Council meeting for the invitation to come along tonight. As Mike mentioned, um, I'm the newest member of the Assembly, um, a Labor member of the Assembly. You probably all know this, but um, I was uh, elected in mid-January um, as a result of Katie Gallagher's uh, resignation, but fortunately, <coughs> I think fortunately very much for the ACT, she's still serving the community in, a, in another capacity, obviously, in the Senate with the, with the retirement of Kate Lundy, who I think um, did a fantastic job, and Katie will continue in, um, uh, with her own unique approach, which um, I admired greatly uh, in her role in the Senate. So uh, I joined the um, the Assembly in um, mid-January and gave my maiden speech about three and a half weeks later in, in, in mid-February. So uh, it was a bit of a surprise, I must say, for that. You, I, I suspect everyone is pretty familiar with how our system works, but. Um, Given that the nature of our electoral system, we don't have by-elections, we have countbacks. So I obviously ran in the 2012 election um, in the seat of Malonglo. Um, I've been a resident of Canberra since 2000, and um, I've spent half that time living in the inner north, um, in Brandon, Turner, and Lynham, and I spent the other half living in Gungahlin. So. Um, I guess I'm well and truly a Northsider, um, <laughs> but many of you will also know that I, I did spend um, uh, most of my time campaigning during the 2012 election on the North Side, but most specifically in, in Gungahlin, my local community where I lived, um, but also quite a bit of time here in the inner North as well. So uh, I, I, I come to the Assembly um, with a, a background largely in um, public policy, largely in the Commonwealth, uh, and largely related to sort of international security and law enforcement issues, um, but I, um, we started having kids in 2006 and uh, I took um, effectively more or less five years out of the full-time workforce and started at that point to, um, I guess, shift my, um, I, I want to make the world a better place, it's a really big world, I was, I was interested, I joined the Labor Party, but largely out of an interest in global issues and international development issues, but um, as I settled in Canberra and as we had children, I, I, I really found the, the sort of somewhat corny adage that all politics is local became part of my day-to-day -day life. I realised that everything that um, I cared about and the impact of the ACT government and the Assembly has on our day-to-day -day lives, on, you know, um, including on our, our work environment, but more importantly our health and education systems, our public transport <coughs> systems, a lot of environment policy, um, a lot of community services policy and a lot of planning, which does have a you know, major impact on your day-to-day -day life, is actually realised through, um, in our case, territory and local politics. So I started to get more active as a result, both in the community and in the Labor Party over that period, uh, and led me to make the decision um, in 2012 to, to seek pre-selection in so, since I've been in, I guess I've got six months under my belt, um, and only 14 or 15 months, I guess, until the next election, which you'll know, and I guess you'll be, um, it'll be interesting to hear your views on, on the new electoral system, but obviously this central Canberra now um, will have um, its own electorate, uh, as will Dungarland and part of Calcona as well. So, um, I'll be seeking pre-selection again for the Labor Party um, in this um, for the next election in the um, northern Canberra seat, the Yerribee seat. So, um, but as everybody does in the Assembly, given the size of our territory, we take a strong interest in uh, how we make things better for the territory as a whole, and then we have our sort of constituent representation work um, based on, on where we're living as well. Some of the issues are very similar and common, um, some are very different. So, um, one of the things that people have talked to me the most about since um, since I was elected in a sort of a day-to-day -day, um, uh, level uh, are roads, <laughs> so, um, which is probably quite a different experience to, um, um, and different issues raised around roads in Gungahlin, for example, than there might be in the <coughs> north. Obviously, Capital Metro is, is a major issue and a, and a real um, interest of mine. Um, I'm a big supporter of the Capital Metro project. Um, so I'm happy to, to, to talk about that. Um, but there's a whole range of local issues to Gungahl, and I haven't had too many issues raised with me directly um, from inner north residents, but I'd be um, keen to hear what sort of interests you have. Uh, I've been busy in the number of committees that I'm serving on, which is the Health Committee, the Education Committee, Public Accounts Committee, and I'm also the Chair of the Planning Environment, 
Territory Municipal Services Committee, uh, as well as at the moment we're in the midst of estimates uh, inquiries. So I hope, um, and I see uh, the things that I um, am doing in the Assembly, both in terms of a, um, first and foremost I think is being a member of the Legislative Assembly, so being a parliamentarian and fulfilling a role in the Assembly that is really about you know, our, our fundamentally about our democratic system and, and um, the roles and responsibilities we have as members of Parliament, representing constituencies, representing a party, and also being an active member of our, you know, of, of our own community. So, the committee and the parliamentary work is actually um, uh, has been more of a revelation to me than I probably anticipated. Uh, as I say, we were in the middle of the estimates deliberations. We had two full weeks of estimates hearings in late June where um, two Liberal members and myself and, and Chris Burke from the Labor um, team, we spoke with ministers and officials um, from uh, 9 to 5 30 every day about everything that was in the budget. So a um, great opportunity to ask questions um, that people have raised with me, which I was able to ask a number of questions. They get really good solid answers and pretty thoughtful answers uh, really than what you might get in other sorts of forums. So um, that's been a really interesting uh, process. And then a lot of um, just sort of getting out trying to meet with as many groups like this and as many different, you know, as wide a variety of people as I can. So um, I, I'm really, I just wanted to give you that bit of a snapshot. Um, I know you've asked me three questions in particular, one about consultation, uh, one about urban open space and, and, and also around the territory plan. So I've I've got some, I, I can answer those questions in detail if people want to start there or I can um, I can just take questions from the floor. So. Okay, uh, well I guess the way we'll do it is that if anyone has questions related to you know, the three questions, it's probably good if they ask it, that way everyone else knows what the context is. Is that, yeah, because not everyone, you, know, you just can't immediately ask, answer a question that we don't all see, or at least immediately. I can put it back to the end, but I'm just conscious that... Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you're 30 seconds, remember? Yeah, yeah you're right, you're right. <laughs> 30 seconds. How long do I have? 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 I didn't record who had proposed these questions, and I know that I proposed the last one. I got a cat for it, Leo. Last one. Well, tell you what, okay, well, where's attachment two on this thing? I can just bring it down so that people at least... Um, um, that's what I think. Oh, no, that's fine. Well, it's a draft minute. Oh, okay, well... Is it in relation to the government's publication? That's it. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we just one. say a few words on it and then we can move on to other questions because it might trigger questions yeah. that other people might have. Yeah, and I, 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 so I will start on these specific questions that what I'm going to talk to you about is I guess my views and what I've come to understand in the government's position on them. What I can't, I mean I, um, these questions to a minister we answer very differently in a sense and they will be, will be to me. So, but look, um, in terms of community engagement, um, <coughs> it's, it's possibly time to have a broader conversation about what this means. Um, look, the principles outlined um, in the 2011 publication, uh, very sound. Uh, I guess it's what I'm interested in the expectations um, of the community and how the government meets those and how we have a more thorough conversation around um, you know, what is happening in the community, what we need to do. I, I do have a strong view that um, in a perfect world, you know, we do everything that we wanted to do, but we just don't have a perfect world. Um, we obviously have a limited budget and you'll, you will hear people talking each and every time there's a budget delivered that a budget is about your priorities and how you fund your priorities in any given budget. But, you know, the ACT budget every year is a $5 billion budget and, you know, in terms of what we talk about, it's often not um, viewed in that overall context. It's also, you know, we have certain responsibilities around um, how we deliver things, um, uh, and, and in terms of where the funding comes from. So uh, I, I have a view that one of the roles that we have as parliamentarians is my approach, and I, I don't expect everyone else to have, but my approach will be that uh, we, we take an approach in the Assembly that 
I guess all of us come into the place generally, and I, and I do believe this of everyone who's currently in the Assembly, and, and if you read every maiden speech of every parliamentarian in the Assembly, they will all say they want to make the world a better place, <laughs> according to how they, and I, and I don't think it serves the community at all to say that, um, that they don't start, at least start with that view. Um, they're all, everyone in the Assembly is passionate about what they do. Um, everyone does um, put in a lot of time uh, in our assembly, I can't talk for other parliaments, um, a lot of time um, in meetings, a lot of time out meeting with the community, um, a lot of time in the assembly. Uh, so, um, I mean, my view is that we approach this with a, um, a view that our, our job is not to say everything that we should do, necessarily, but what, what we can realistically achieve. So, um, in terms of the, the consultation, I'm not sure. I th think, um, I don't think there's, uh, I think there's probably enough hours put into consultation efforts. Whether that is as effective as it could be, I'm not, whether we're reaching as broad an area, a group of people in particular. I must say, I go to the Gungala Community Council and have been for four years solid. I've, apart from in the end meetings, which generally attract over 100 people, you're lucky to get more than 20. In fairness to every gentleman in the room, it's 90% men, and it's 90% of men are over probably, I'd say, 50 or 60, which again is no, but it's not representative of, which not to say that their views aren't also worthwhile listening to, there's a whole range of other people, and I only use that as an example because it's, I was at a Rotary meeting last night, um, to my surprise, 70% of the members there were women, um, and half of them were probably under 40. Which is not, which wasn't my. Maybe everybody knows more about Rotary than I do. So I think it's tapping into as wide a group of people as you can, providing lots of different options for having your say. Um, and I have a view around um, at what points we do it. You know, if you have a, you know, if you have a proposition and you say we're going to do this, what do you think? And it's a well, 20% of people think they say they think it's a good idea, and 30% don't, and 50% aren't sure. Um, I'm not convinced that that's the best way to go about it. I think that the idea of a conversation is a better idea, a broader conversation is a better idea. Exactly how you do that, no one's got the perfect answer. So. Number two, when we go through the thing, can I just, as a follow up, say that I think the point of that question was that sometimes you go to a consultation and you feel like they're listening to me yeah. and they're taking it on board, and other consultations you think they're just telling me what they want me to believe and they're not I agree. listening at all. And I think there are some directors that do it better than others. And what if the others do it Which ones? Do it <laughs> I mean, than ones? Which um, ones? Yeah. And the other them? point to that question, because I, I framed that question, yeah, yeah. It, it's about what measures, how we measure this, because everything in the end, yeah. if you don't measure it, yeah, yeah, no, what no, the I, bloody hell do you know? Look, oh, it's, it's one that. I can certainly sort of take back and get specifics on in terms of measurement. I just didn't have the opportunity to get a sort of a, a response from from the minister in particular, who's the the, the, the person that has some of the details um, uh, with you know, the relationship with the director that does a lot of this um, that does a lot of this. But I would be interested in your views on which ones do it better than others, though. If people have if there's a consensus about that, sure. I don't know. Not particularly interested. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but too long. But I, look, my, I mean, my guess would be you um, deal largely with environment planning, directorate, and economic development. Probably not health, education, JACs, which is you know a very significant part of at least what we spend in our budgets. So um, uh, yeah, and, and I, I think how do you I mean, how do you measure effectiveness of consultation as opposed to how do you measure effectiveness of an actual outcome yeah, are two different questions as well because sometimes if, if you know nothing that anyone ever does I will agree with 100% and if I voice that opinion does that therefore mean that the consultation was ineffective I don't, I don't know. I, I guess an example at a practical level is that it's in my six months of participating in this type of forum um, I've observed a number of times that there are quite complex and long and lengthy pieces of work that government directorates and agencies are seeking the community councils 
and residents groups' opinions on, as well as members of the public who'd like to contribute, that some of those are extremely lengthy documents and the, with limited periods of time to respond. I mean, an example is the, you know, the Capital Metro's um, EIS, yeah. 1,500 pages, you, you know, and being able to, to try to get people who are operating in a voluntary capacity on behalf of their communities to be able to go into these sorts of things, let alone the, down, the downloads and all the rest of it, it, sometimes the periods of time to respond are insufficient, um, allowing for the fact that public servants can do it nine to five, whereas the rest of us are doing it outside of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, there's not too many documents. I don't know, I'm not aware of any document. Like, for example, I'm aware that there is literally three printed copies of that EIS because it's so big. It's pretty unusual to have something that big. I take your point on that. I mean, the standard time frame is six weeks, and I'm not aware of, um, there's very few instances where that six weeks isn't, isn't made available. And I, I would, I mean, certainly in terms of pushing out information, the government's actually very good at that through its websites, through media releases, through Twitter, through Facebook, at a central level. You've got to have time to do it. Sorry? You've got to have time to go through it. Oh, yeah. You know. I mean, um, even public yeah. servants. I mean, I went and spoke to the place manager, you know? The, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, north, the, the one at the city. city one, yeah. And she hadn't read the environment no. impact statement. Mm -hmm. I tried oh, to ask questions, and she said, oh, it's, it's, and it's, and it's, and it's, it's too big. <laughs> um, so it's too big for people who are being paid to read it. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, uh, yeah, I mean, in fairness to her, she's been in the job for two weeks, and of, of all the things that she has to do, you know, I'm, I'm sure she has the intention of reading it. She's doing the job. I mean, we're not, we, we as a community organisation, yeah. we out in the community take on all these jobs, including try and make a living or something, right? Um, I'm not, I, I just, I, I really, I, I, I really loathe when, <laughs> when you ring up public servants and they don't know what they're like. <coughs> so I have a good time getting stuck into it, believe me, and I'm not interested in if she's been in the job a few weeks or a few days or ten years. Often it makes no difference. You've got to get on top of it. And if you, if you the communities ask to, cons the, to put in consultation, give them a fair go. Because more often than not, these things take the old all bar none, I won't refer to its bloody current name, but the old all bar none, and I kind of wanted to extend its, um, uh, extend its um, trading hours. And it was done over bloody Christmas. They put in the submission just before Christmas. I mean, you know. <laughs> Oh, look, cynical, I'm yeah. cynical. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I, I do think in fairness that place manager is a, you know, they wanted to get the position in place and, and um, um, I, I think it's reasonable to give people who have been in the job for two weeks. You could either have her out there talking, you know, at, sitting in an office for the first two weeks reading the EIS or, or out talking to people and, and hopefully get across it. I can feed that back because that's, um, you know, I think um, stating that it's two well, weeks probably not that ideal. I, th I think, you know, the when I started to move on to the business case, it was even less familiar to her. Yeah. I mean, if these people should not be put out to the public yeah, I'm sorry. without some training or yeah. experience uh, or someone sitting with them. I mean, this yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, lady no, I, 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 was completely you. on her own, yeah. and all she could do was take my questions away. Yeah. And I, and then I got the prepackaged yeah. answers um, back, yeah. which. I, I'm, I'm, I, I will definitely so pass we can't, that back on. You but can't argue yeah. with these people at all because yeah. they, they just haven't got the right. Sorry, Marianne. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, I'd just like to draw you back to the last bit there, which I think it's, it's that you're particularly wanting to draw attention to, which is what evaluation plan is in, in place to measure the use of the guide and the effectiveness of communication, of community engagement across directorates. I get the feeling, and I, my experience has been with the Commonwealth Government, and I've been a resident of um, Canberra for many, many years, that looking from that perspective, that the ACT government does not do community um, engagement well and consultation well. And I think it's largely because there's not a commitment in the first instance and also there is not proper evaluation done. I was interested to see Catherine Tay White on Q&A last night. She has a very fine reputation in this area of community consultation. You may not always agree with what she, her findings come up with, but she's certainly well respected in the area. And I, I get the feeling of almost <coughs> every touch in, in a community sense, especially with land development issues and environmental issues, 
There is simply not a dedication to a whole body of literature about community consultation and engagement and evaluation. And I just don't see it there. And I think that the one message coming back from the community and in, in, in light of this particular um, question, I'd really like to see a much greater effort put to the discipline that's involved in proper community consultation. I don't question. And collaboration is much better than consultation. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, look, I agree. I mean, I agree on that. That's sort of, yeah, the idea of having a conversation. Um, yeah, so we have Cathy. Hey. Hi, it's my name, Cathy. I'm uh, one of Mr. Fluffy Homeowner. Okay. Look, I want to ask you uh, the two questions that Mr. Fluffy community want to ask. Yeah. One is that why the, the government, which is you are part of, rejected the gold alone options uh, even though it doesn't affect ACT government budget bottom line old. And the other question is also is that why now the ACT government introduced a gate fee for people who go alone options? Because this is some, like a new one that initially uh, you know you guys keep saying that no there's no fee for to, oh, to be honest, so it's a gate fee? Yes. So I've never heard of that, sorry. So, mm -hmm. look, um, I, what is that? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I've raised the question with you before in relation to going a lot of options and stuff. But with me? Yes. It right. was my emails and... Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, yeah, well, I can talk to you um, yeah. specifically. I don't recall a gate fee. The gate fee, just, we just learned it this week as well. Oh, okay, yes. So, so just yeah. like, why is it any obstacle for board alarm option people gone? You know, yeah. they keep ch seem to be the government keep changing the policy every day, really. Yeah. So what's oh, the fee to do? They don't even tell us like how much the fee costs. The, the gate fee basically when you go to loan option, you uh, manage everything yourself. But when you go into <coughs> um, the Mr. Fluffy asbestos, they charge us a gate fee. This is G A T or a company sponsor for the Simply like make up. It's a government that can do what they want to. So it yeah, appears so. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Sorry, okay. Um, so the, I guess the, the, the Task force will be here following Megan's yeah. presentation, so I guess it's good to give, let you know what's going on there because you've discussed it. Yeah. And um, I guess it'd be worth just you know discussing with Kathy later. Sure. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, what, what I know um, about the task force in, in, in my capacity is largely uh, I mean, um, uh, we, we discussed it at quite some length in the estimates hearing. So um, and. Uh, I, I, what Andrew Kifford, the head of the task force, said in the meetings was um, uh, the the gold alone option has been ruled out by the government. Um, Why is that? I don't, I don't know. I'm sorry, I can't. Look, Andrew Kifford will be able to give you. I assume it's Andrew Kifford, is it? Or maybe anyway, someone from the task force will be able to. Well, we keep asking your expression to the task force, and the task force said it's a government policy, so it's go back to the government. And the government. Okay, but look, it's worth knowing what's going on with the, Yeah, yeah, yeah I did the game I'll be interested in finding yeah. what what I what I do know, what I did learn this week, which I think was public information that as of the thirtieth of June when the when the scheme the the, the the current scheme sort of closed, there's only I think eight um, households have not at least registered with the scheme. So there are there are only eight householders who are I'm aware of that haven't um, Giving themselves the option of even registering the scheme because registering with the scheme um, was what the government was encouraging up until the 30th of June. So the people at least had an option to be in the scheme, and there's no obligation to stay with it, um, and every opportunity to sort of opt out later on. So. Yeah. All right. yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Right. Uh, John, on time. Two questions. You mentioned about everyone that goes into Legislative Assembly has all these bright ideas, etc, etc. I've talked to some in the past and they had their bright ideas, but when they got in there they found the system is so um, aggressive and adversarial that their ideas got shot down in the first two seconds and never, never surfaced again. Are you going to be one of these fighting people to get past the system that 
uh, that they all get together and say, well, this is what we're going to do. Sorry, your idea is not fitting into our program. That's the first question. The second one is, you're on a, um, what do you call it, a um, committee? Um, yeah. Oh, Which one? The, the money. Um, oh, public accounts. Public yep. accounts. Yep. It happens every other year that someone comes in, they have a committee to find out where the wastage is in the government. Can you please do something about it and save the billions of bucks that the ACT government wastes every year in some of the exorbitant salaries that some of these people get for a start, plus the money that's wasted in doing things that is so inefficient that it's our money and our, I mean my rates have gone up 10% a year for the last two years. My commercial property has gone up 60% in the last three years on a small business, no one ever listens to any of that. Can you then please get the government to stop wasting the money? And it's got to be billions of bucks they waste a year, even though they've got a, only a five billion dollar budget. Um, and sort the system out from that side before they start jacking everybody's rates or whatever, because the government can't make money. I think you're not, I'll come work in many nothing. places anyway but after rates. <laughs> Sorry, let's, uh, okay, we'll stop well, there. So let's get the. Okay, yeah, you, over to you. Yeah, that's it. Well, simple question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. The first question. Yeah, simple. The first one was about you know people coming in with a you know belief, and um, well, I think you know everyone still retains that. Um, I, I can I pretty much tell you the sort of the personal passions of a lot of. Um, all, all the members in the assembly that they constantly raise that you know. No, um, you're, yours. What's yeah. your? You're the new one. What's yeah. your? Some of your ideas that you have that you would be yeah. passionate about yeah. that you'd like to see done. Yeah. Oh, and will they ever get done? Is the well, some of them are getting done, and yeah. look, I guess um, there's my you know broad principles around you know fairness and opportunity. Um, you know that everybody getting the you know, the, the, the most opportunity they can to live to their potential, I think, is just, you know, and that starts from, you know, from birth and then, it, you know, it, it, it goes into, you know, strong families, into good schools, into good education, good community services, you know. I care about the future, so I do care about the environment and I do care about our public transport system, um, you know, and I, and I do care that we, you know, we don't, uh, we don't sort of slide, I do care about the economy that's functioning, there's enough money in the economy, um, that comes to the government so the government can deliver services to the people. I think starting with the people that need it most um, to give them the opportunity and then, you know, at, at the rest of the community as well. Um, what, what I have found um, is, you know, the system is not just the, you know, the system is all of us. It's not, you know, it's not expressly my job to just fix the system. It's a big part of my job, but it's what we all do every day when we, in, you know, when you come to this meeting, you, you're about wanting to help fix the system. So, um, it's, um, I, for example, the thing, I was genuinely surprised at how many people raised with me roads as an issue in Gungahlin. I mean, it's an area that has nearly 50,000 people and of the four main roads in there, all but one is a single lane road, often a single lane road with lots of, so there's a, just a lot of impact on coming in and leaving um, that, part of the ta uh, that part of the city every day. And because there's, you know, virtually no jobs out there, um, but the ACT government made a significant decision to change that because there's now 700 people, nearly 700 people working in an ACT government office block out there, which has had a big impact on the local small businesses out there in terms of trade that's there from 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. Um, you know, um, it's, it's a fantastic building for 700 odd people to work in. There's a childcare centre, there's a cafe, there's a very interesting um, um, and new shop front, so that goes, oh, we talked about that more about Access Canberra in terms of waste and inefficiency. But um, roads was a big issue. Uh, look, I, I was struck by it in the first couple of months. There'd been a community council survey which had about 1,400 responses. Overwhelmingly, roads was the biggest issue for people. Um, I had a petition <coughs> um, to duplicate one of the major roads there, Gundaroo Drive, which is a major east west link. So, um, you know. Not long after I was elected, I, I started a petition to advocate to, to my party in government that they should spend money 
um, in this particular area, in this particular part of town. So, I, I mean, I started off in that sense. I won't be having a petition every five minutes, and it's not the only way to get things done, but um, if, I just can't explain to you the range of issues that have been raised with me. Like, they're just... What's your biggest passion that you want to see done before you actually got elected? Yeah. Oh, look, it was, it was about, you know, people having the opportunity to reach their potential. And I, felt like, and I see that being achieved in so many different ways. Um, so what I've got to do is find the best way and the opportunities for me to have influence on those issues when they come up, whether it's a health-related issue, an education-related issue, um, uh, community services-related issue. Um, you know, that's what, that's what sort of drove me um, coming into politics. Whether the, I, I, I can't tell you of one specific thing um, in particular that is my overriding um, um, sort of passion, one particular policy program or initiative that, that I have in mind. Um, I'm sort of in the information gathering stage with my, what I think you know, my values are. Um, but I do see that being achieved through a whole range of different ways in the Assembly. So I didn't get into politics to talk about roads, I would say, <laughs> but it does have a big impact on people's lives and that is why I got into politics. I was wondering if we could address maybe the second question. I think it, it is a big issue here in the inner north is about accessible open space mm -hmm. because there is that concern that you know as far as you know as far as the area densifying yeah. that of course what you're doing is consolidating the indoor space and uh, with the idea that there has to be a consolidated outdoor space yeah. and I think sometimes is the view at least from what I've seen is that. The indoor space, there's a lot of concentration on putting a lot more indoor space out there without thinking too much about the outdoor space and that, in a way, the, the urban open space is is the easiest target, if you want to call it that, yeah. for building. So I just <coughs> was wondering if you could address a bit of that. Yeah, um, look, I, I, look, I, and I agree, um, I, I certainly agree that it's important. Um, if we're talking about urban open space, it's defined in the territory plan. Um, I could, I could be wrong, but I don't see any swathes of um, um, urban open space being redeveloped for infill. That's not, um, I mean, that is very difficult to do in the territory plan. Um, there's no intention to be. Quite a few places out. Yeah, but really, I mean, look, I, I, like I say, I've lived half my time in Canberra in the inner north and half my time in Gungahlin. Um, yeah, I, I can't, and, and I've lived in, 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 in Sydney and Auckland and, and I've lived from New Zealand, but um, you know, um, I do some. I'm, I'm not sure what urban open space in terms of you know what's in the territory plan, and I, I, like I could, um, I can walk out my door and the, the five different, five or six different places I've lived in the Canberra, um, and be from where I live now, I can walk to Yerby Ponds and around there in, in ten minutes. I can walk into Mulligan's Flat within fifteen minutes, and I can walk into the Tangangala Town Centre. You know, I, personally, that, that, that suited us really well, but um, I, I'm, I, I agree it's important, um, but I, I'm not sure that densification at the moment is removing urban open spaces as defined in the territory plan. It's um, removing the best open space we have is people's backyards. People's backyards with trees and birds and animals and lizards that have been swallowed up by many big mansions that don't, in my view, and a lot of people I talk to, you know, kind of, they don't belong in our suburbs and in our streets. Well, can I say that I, I do, I do, best I'm not sure if you visited other parts of Canberra, um, no, but, definitely. yeah, but, but, you know, not everywhere in Canberra um, is 40 or 50 years old, or, or even 100 years old. The, the variety of housing that there is across is broad. Some people don't want a backyard. Um, so lots of people who don't want a backyard want planning. trees and, and birds and wildlife and being able to accept planning and make that accessible. Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't agree. Yeah, okay. um, and um, I mean, most people that visit this city, their overwhelming comment is about its beautiful open spaces. You know, the, the amount. I mean, we've got figures. We had discussions about this. In the, Estimates here is about the amount of open space there is in Canberra and the amount of the number of urban trees there are, and you know some of the figures on how um, um, how much we have. Um, you know, are, are pretty impressive compared to any other major city, in, 
And I, I mean, I don't want to see that lost, but um, densification, um, you know, um, how we deal with our population and where people live and what sorts of housing they have available. We did hear quite a bit of evidence um, in the estimates committee from um, a couple of community groups who said that there are a lot of people who want to downsize, a lot of older people, this was from the National Seniors Association, a lot of older people want to downsize in their um, existing suburbs. Um, they don't want to be able to have to maintain a very large property, but they want to stay where they have social connections. Um, but but that, that, to some extent that involves further um, intensification. So um, um, I, I do believe in an appropriate mix of, of you know, the right density. Um, oh, look, and I have lived, only two years ago did I move into a standalone house. I've lived in flats and townhouses including with three small children. And I, I'm, my personal experience of living in townhouses and apartments is actually when we moved into a standalone house, um, we actually had less connection with our neighbours than we did living in townhouse complexes. And we shared less. Um, you know, we, didn't share, we, we used to share a driveway in a townhouse of um, six or seven townhouses. And you know, the kids ran up and down the driveway freely, but some of them didn't have backyards. But, so are there any other questions on, on uh, like whether it's an urban open space or I don't know, it's Dixon Section 72 or any other? Section 72. Well, we are. I just wasn't uh, any questions for Megan <coughs> before she goes. That's just, uh, well, here. Shop? It's right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're in it. It's, it's the future of this particular area, you see. This, the, this is Rosevear the, Place and this? Or the, yes. Oh, right. Right. Okay. Yeah, it basically from the pool to where the playing fields are. That's, yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is the um, yeah. Omnibus Territory Plan. It's Creation part of it, so yeah, 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 it's one um, part of it. So. And I guess it does uh, go into question three about the territory plan. Now, um, I'm just conscious of the time. Um, are you, anyone? It's festive. Yeah. Okay, we've got our asbestos <laughs> people here, okay. Uh, are there any other questions for me before she goes? Uh, well, I asked. The last one. Yeah, go ahead. Yep. Okay, uh, how can we re-simplify the territory plan? Quick background is back in 2008 when we built, did a new planning and development act, we had things like the residential zone meant the same thing all over Canberra except for eight precincts which had exceptions. Then about the end of 2012 the environment and planning directorate decided that we could have exceptions in any of uh, about 19 district precinct maps which covered the whole of the territory. And then we could have exceptions to those exceptions <coughs> in 108 suburb precincts maps that covered every suburb. And that was in addition to the 59 suburb precinct codes that allowed for exceptions to the exceptions to the exceptions. <laughs> um, and now they deny that they've done it. <laughs> so it's, it's a bit difficult to consult with somebody who denies that the problem exists. Um, and Coles and Dover couldn't even figure out the planning rules. Um, and they're, they're routinely approving things that break the rules because the rules are so complicated. So how can we unscramble the egg? So what, what I what I what I can tell you because um, look, a lot of people that have been dealing with you know, it, particularly in community council, have been dealing with planning issues. Um, can I be honest? You will have you know, in some ways, more access to planning department officials through consultations than I have the opportunity to do. Um, partly it's a, it's, a, it's a burden on you because of the things that you're asked to comment. It is <coughs> an enormous privilege which a lot of, um, you know, a, a, lot, a lot of people just cannot possibly have the time to do. But we had this discussion with Minister Gentleman, the Planning Minister, during estimates, and he did say uh, expressly he has asked um, um, planning to look at ways to simplify the territory plan. So. We didn't really get very far in terms of you know, what that's going to involve, but he was pretty clear about that. So, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know if you've had um, Nick here, um, um, since no. the planning minister, but, uh, you know... Um, well, how's he planning to consult and collaborate? <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, look, uh, I think... Um, turn up. Yeah, well, if you, oh, look, if you invite him, I'm sure he'll turn up, but he's probably got literally 20 invitations a week, so I'm, I'm sure if you give him enough notice and say you meet at this regular time, he'll be able to find a time to come and talk to you, so. Did we invite? Um, yeah, we did. We didn't send him a reminder. Yeah, okay. <laughs>
Yeah. Um, squeeze it in somewhere, though. Anyway. Can I make uh, a suggestion then? Yep. I've looked at the Parramatta and Bankstown planning codes, yep. um, which really are a reflection of all the major areas of Sydney, and they're really good, solid planning codes. Yep. And I think what we're doing in Canberra here is reinventing the wheel. Yep. When we could take, for example, what they've used in Sydney, yep. and they have hard numbers to do measurements by, yep. rather than words of, uh, you know, soft words about uh, sufficient yep. versus numbers. In keeping so, the yeah. streets going. Anyway. So you're talking about um, territory plan, um, as opposed to master plans, and um, because I, I, I mean, I must say it's a struggle to get across what all the layers are and how, and every time I, I hear a call from a suburb for a suburb plan or a master plan, I do, I have wondered whether in the past that's because um, as many things are, an issue arises and, and it's fixed at a certain point in time and has that context and um, as there's more and more calls for specific <coughs> plans for suburbs to deal with specific local issues, you, you inevitably can, you know, disappear down that a little bit, so... It's very complicated. In fact, you know, I mean, part of the joke is once you figure you understand the language, you've lost everyone else. So yeah, yeah, like yeah. That, so. but, but I'm not sure that the yeah. the Coles and Doma one. Um, I mean, my my read, literally reading of, 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 of largely the media around that one, that, that again was discussed in estimates mm -hmm. and um, what was that. Um, my sense was the feedback from the inner north community is they didn't like it. Mm. So right. the, the, that it doesn't comply with the territory plan. It was rejected because you don't like it. It was rejected because it didn't comply with the territory plan. That was part of it. The, 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 we had this discussion and <coughs> some of it was because it didn't comply with some aspects of the territory plan. But the biggest issue was was the um, this, uh, you know, literally how it looked um, and that it just was such a significant development. and the, Director General of EPD, Dorte Eklund, actually spoke at quite some length about this, so I would be happy to get that hand and forward it on to right. the Community Council so you can see her explanation. She talked quite a lot about the um, rubbish collection around the back as well uh, of it in terms of its aesthetic and sort of logistical impact on pedestrians as well. So, so I've got just a quick one for you. Okay, last question. Last question. I'm not convinced, given Simple. the last <laughs> Right, the government says, this is the asbestos thing, yep. the government says it's going to lose $400 million and it's cost them a billion to set this scheme up to make money for themselves. Now... Can I, I, yeah, I do need to respond to that. I'll yes, well, right, yeah, you can, yeah, I know. Um, now, it was 800 square metre minimum size block to do a dual lock. Yep. The government, someone in its wisdom thought, maybe we can make it 700, then we can catch more blocks into the system so we can make more money. Now, to me, the people are lost out, the people that own the asbestos houses. If the government makes money out of this whole system by changing the rules to suit themselves, mm -hmm. could they please then refund it to the people that own the houses? Yes or no? If the government, there is no scenario, there is no scenario under there which has to be. the government makes money. There is no, I can reach, I mean, I, look, the I, if I'm wrong, at the I'm end of the day will make a fortune. No, it no. It will, because no, it if it loses on the money that it sells the blocks for, for the rates that it charges for all the dual lockies and for all the things for the time to come, they will make a say five, ten, no. twenty times the no. rates Never. than they would have before. No, a look, a absolutely not. Can you record okay. that, please, yeah. on the meeting? It's that nice recording. Look, no. I'm not, am I, I mean, I, there is no scenario under which the government makes money. Okay. I can't okay. make money because it's so inefficient <laughs> and hopeless. No. Okay, okay. okay, look, I don't want to look, we have, we have actually a segue here because we actually do have the asbestos <laughs> yeah, response yeah. task force. So well, I, I think that they are probably, it's probably more appropriate to ask the questions of them. In the meantime, why do we, I'm oh, sorry, do you have any? I, why I'm do you want to answer to my first part of my question? Well, well, can you remind me of that? <laughs> 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 so, yeah, um, I, you'll have all the, 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 the details of this, but... Um, I, I do agree that the biggest impact, obviously, is on, on people. I'm not um, an asbestos well, person. It doesn't worry me personally, but, um, uh, yeah. but it does have a broader impact on, on the community. It's dramatic. 
uh, um, both in terms of neighbours, people that have visited homes, lived in the homes, it does have an impact. It has a significant impact on the budget, which has an impact on how we, um, what else we do. So, Kat, I, I, I want to be very quick. Kathy, was there well, something? Well, I just respond the way, uh, what's his answer to him? The government may not make the money in the scheme as a whole, but I can guarantee you that the government make the money on top on my block. So individual cases. I can guarantee you that. Okay, there, there, well. there will be, um, and I'll, look, I'm able to answer questions differently than yeah. than, than officials are. Um, that is probably not the case. It's because no, because on the land, yes, but. If you also take into account the cost of purchasing your home, um, of demolishing the home, uh, and removing all of that, uh, in terms of the land, yes, but you will—it's—it's um, it's not a comparison that you can make in terms of yes, if land, if, if you live on one of the blocks, it's now between 700 and 800. If the draft variation um, does go through. Um, there will be additional funding come back, given the value of the land. Yes. But that has that that in terms of the cost to the community, because as you say, it's it's no the money. cost of the community is different to the money that the government can get out of this. Because what I'd like to see, talking about the money, then, it's like this young lady here, yeah. right? She's basically got I don't know what the dollar figure is paid by the government. There should be a list seeing that they've, they've named every single address in Canberra that is a fluffy house. Put more columns next to that and say, well, we bought this lady's house for this amount of dollars. Yep. We sold the block for this. It cost us this much to demolish the house, blah, blah, blah. And then see what the figure is in the last column, whether it's a plus it or minus a, for the government. It will always be the, a minus. Plus no, the then put the another value. column to say for the next five years the government gets twice the rates or four times the rates depending on how they sell that block off as in the next thing. Uh, it's money in the government's pocket. The, uh, for basically just, doing I, I want nothing. to be really, really clear about this. That the, the, the overall, like there's a billion dollar loan. I mean, you'll have the figure. I don't have yeah, the figures yeah. off it. Yeah. But, but at a minimum, this is going to cost the ACT community $350 million at a minimum. 400 is a figure that keeps coming up, but that, well, was, but that yeah, came up months and months and months ago. Yeah, but but now they've changed the rules. No, I okay, hang on everyone. Okay, I'm <laughs> just kind of I'm conscious that the, the, the people are really more of the experts on it are here. And look, can we let's let's uh, thank Megan for her time. It's uh, a. <laughs>